Hello uh, YouTube, this is Yuan again. I wanted to do a quick video to show you guys some older data that I processed recently of the Eagle Nebula. It is one of the most famous nebulas out there because of the pillars of creation that were immortalized by James Webb recently in the Hubble telescope uh, all those years ago. Obviously, I don't have their resolution or their focal length, so mine is going to be much wider. Uh, but it's a very beautiful nebula. It's in a part of the sky that's uh, hard for me because it rises and sets pretty quickly with the center of the Milky Way. Um, and there's a lot of lights and other obstructions in the way. So I had this data since July. I never really thought about it. I decided to take a look at it the other day. And after processing it, I decided it warrants a video. And it's actually a, a pretty beautiful image. So let's take a look at what equipment I use and uh, what did I get. So going into PixInsight, again, it's using this little guy. Uh, I promise I'll do more videos with other telescopes, but for now, the uh, speed of this telescope, the F3, makes it so much, attract uh, so much more attractive than the larger F5.4 and F8 telescopes because it's fast, it collects data at uh, a different pace, and with 15, 16, maybe 20 hours of integration, I have something incredible to show. So this data was captured back in July. California was going through a lot of heat waves. The seeing and the transparency weren't the best. The optics themselves also changed uh, over the course of the night as it got cooler. So it's not the best when it comes to imaging conditions but again this telescope always uh, impresses me with its adaptability and its ability to kind of take a pretty bad light polluted sky and create beautiful images. Um, this is the exact configuration I had, same full frame QHY600 mono camera, chroma filters, uh, the auto guider was, I think, either positioned underneath or in the same position. It doesn't really matter. Um, the image scale is pretty big, so auto guiding isn't necessarily a, a big problem here. Um, I don't have uh, the conditions to show you guys how I image, but as soon as I have a clear sky and I can record a video, I will. Um, I use different tools than some of the other astrophotographers. Um, they're all kind of doing the same job. It's what you find the best and what works for your process the most. So let's take a look at what I got. So let's look at the channels individually. So hydrogen looks uh, impressive. The stars are round. The pillars of creation, which I was discussing a few minutes ago, are these guys in the center. Uh, <laughs> you can see them in a much bigger image from James Webb and Hubble, I recommend you look at it because they are mind-blowing. This is about, I would say, almost six hours of um, hydrogen. The, nebula the dark nebulosity is also very beautiful. This part of the sky is uh, close to the center of the Milky Way, so there's a lot of um, nebulosity there, dark nebulosity and hydrogen emission nebulosity and so forth. Even oxygen looks decent. Um, there's some... Uh, pixels here because I didn't use darks as you can see these hot pixels kind of create streaks that actually um, they've been removed the subsequent uh, stack I think had darks which removed this you don't want to have this because it, these will show up when you start stretching the image as images as blue lines almost and you don't want these um, I did remove them in the final stack so this is just I think I opened up the wrong O3 file but the data is good the nebulosity looks good. Uh, oxygen usually looks almost like an inverse. A lot of the times an inverse of hydrogen looks like. In this case, the pillars of creation in that star forming region is rich in oxygen-3 gas. So there's a lot to see there. Now, sulfur is also actually pretty good. There's a lot of data in sulfur. The pillars of creation actually look very similar to hydrogen because they're in the red spectrum. And the stars are good. The detail is really good. There's a cluster next to the Eagle Nebula. The nebula itself extends a lot. I did rotate the camera. I was having some issues with the filter wheel at the time. And you can see sulfur, which is the last channel I captured, does have a little bit of a cutoff. 
I think I can fix that later in processing. I'm not really too worried about this. Again, I'm not trying to discover intelligent life or messages from another galaxy. I'm just trying to capture nebulosity and show people the beauty of space. If it's a little bit off and you have a corner that's been fixed, so be it. If you don't like it, I'm sorry. That's just how space imaging works in light polluted skies. It's false color and sometimes you have to improvise. The data looks really well. I was really happy with it. I didn't know how much detail I could pull out of it. So I ended up stacking it. And what I did is I actually changed my workflow a little bit. Um, so after I stacked the channels, this is a regular SHO, sulfur and red, hydrogen in green and oxygen in blue. I decided to start the process differently. So using the blood exterminator, um, I did deconvolution and it also looks at a few other factors on the linear image and the results were really good. Um, it deconvolutes the stars really well, so any flooding or any other things that will come off the star are gone. Uh, it also shrinks the stars a little bit. Um, I was really happy with the stack. Uh, the details are beautiful. The golden color is, is typical Hubble. Now what I did after is I removed the stars and I started really stretching the image. Now this looks like a pretty noisy mess and it's fine. This is a lot of the time images look like this. There's not enough data and also light pollution and other factors uh, create this. My seeing wasn't the best. So it looks really beautiful. I know it's really noisy and that's fine. As you can see, the pillars of creation in the center for a telescope as small as this, an eight inch with 600 millimeters focal length. This really sh goes to show you what the power of aperture does. So the larger the aperture of your telescope, the more details you collect, the more light. The focal length and f ratio have to do with uh, what is your field of view. But if you have a 20 inch f3 scope or f2 scope, your details are going to be really sharp. It just depends on matching it with the right camera. So this is, again, I was really blown away with the details for such a small focal length telescope. But the aperture, as they say, is king. The bigger the aperture, the better the resolution of the images. So from this noisy mess, I decided to do a little bit of color mixing. Uh, if you haven't seen it by now, I don't like the kind of golden uh, tint that the Hubble images get. So I try to improvise and do a little bit of color mixing. Again, false color narrowband images are not really 100% accurate. They're far off because sulfur and hydrogen are both red. But in my view, I really want to get as close as I can to the real uh, thing. But highlighting nebulosity and emission nebula. Emission nebulosity, excuse me. So I took this and then I did some color mixing and a noise reduction. The number of steps for processing this were very, very limited. I stacked it did a blood exterminator and deconvolution in there. I stretched it. I did a little bit of curves adjustment, uh, a couple of HDR multi-transforms to pull back the details in the core. That was it, nothing too fancy. I think um, if you overthink processing, you're gonna end up spending a lot of time and it's probably not gonna be that much different. After that, the final images that we're gonna get to are actually Again, I'm really happy with them. The pillars of creation look really sharp. The stars are really good and small. The color mixing really brought back the reds and kind of replaced them. Did leave a little few, uh, did little bit of or a little bit of orange in there, but it made it where I was really happy with the way the palette looks, the nebulosity look, the dark nebulosity is very, very clear, which I'm really happy with. There's almost like a smaller nebula inside here, as you can see. And again, probably one of the best uh, eagle nebula wide images I've taken. I've taken, uh, I've had a chance to image this with the Takahashi FSQ 106N, an older version of the very popular uh, astrograph, but wasn't even close. Uh, I think that what changed it here is I really limited the steps I took to process it and I really focused on cleaning up the stack data so looking at star size looking at the gradients in the image so from maybe 140 frames I was left maybe with 90 and has nothing to do with tracking just the conditions of the sky when it's really hot or really humid you might end up with 
really massive stars and that creates an issue. So that's why I'm very, very um, strict about filtering the frames that I stack. It's more important to have better frames than to have five or six frames that have some kind of clouds or bad transparency, which will create almost like a towel effect in your image, if you will. It'll, it'll, it'll really mess it up when you stretch it aggressively or create patterns that cannot be flat fielded out. Um, so I am really happy with this image. I'm curious to think what you all think about it. Um, the colors are more natural. The nebulosity is really good. I could have collected maybe twice as much data. Uh, what would have resulted is maybe less noise in some cases, but the problem is this object's only available for maybe five or six hours a night for me at best. And the first few hours are under, uh, the, the nebula is gonna be above a house with AC that runs continuously. So what that does is it makes those frames almost be trash.